Hi everyone, this is Zach Rubin and I'm the Executive Director of the Alumni Learning Consortium. Today's webinar is part of our series on advancement and alumni relations topics to help alumni offices improve engagement. I'm joined today with Dan DeWert from Marquette University who will be presenting today on their award-winning student alumni mentoring program. Dan is the Senior Director of Marquette Mentors and Engagement. He's worked at Marquette University Advancement for more than 14 years and has been with the Marquette Mentors program since its inception. Uh, thanks so much for joining with us today, Dan. Hi, Zach. Thanks so much for the opportunity to join everybody here. Of course, really glad to have you. Um, there is going to be time for questions at the end. Um, Dan will present for, for 30 to 40 minutes here. Um, as you have questions, please click the Ask a Question button that's right below the video. Um, to ask your questions throughout the presentation, and we'll we'll get to them a little later. Um, and Dan, again, thank you so much for joining with us today. I'll uh, hand it over to you and let you take it away. Excellent. Thanks, Zach. And thanks again to everybody for the opportunity to share a little bit about our story um, at Marquette with Marquette Mentors. And before I get started here, just for some context, um, for those who aren't familiar with Marquette, we're located in Milwaukee. We have a student population of 12,000 overall, 8,000 undergraduate students and 4,000 graduate students. And we also have approximately 115,000 living alumni globally. So I'll talk a little bit about our alumni, our students, um, and also our campus partners. So before we get started here, I just wanna share a brief overview about what we'll um, discuss today. And as Zach mentioned, please share any questions as we move along and we'll make sure we get to as many as we can toward the end of our, our time together. So I'd like to share program history, objectives, uh, our trifecta and stakeholders, really how the story um, evolved with respect to Marquette Mentors, an overview and logistics about the program, metrics which are absolutely critical to what we found uh, with the program since we launched in 2013, and ultimately what we've learned and how we've adjusted. And I think uh, what we can all agree upon, this is a story that was in the New York Times last year, want to leave a legacy, be a mentor. I think whether you have a program that's well established, um, you're thinking about mentor opportunities with students or alumni, um, faculty, staff, whatever that may look like. I think that we all agree, especially in light of the pandemic and these um, evolving times that we're all facing, um, mentoring is absolutely essential and can be a real game changer in terms of how to support students. And as we found through our own communication with students, um, when things started to evolve and and change in mid-March, so many of our conversations with students talked about those internships that went virtual or those internships that dried up and didn't exist or the internships that were deferred. Um, the interaction and the opportunity that we found at Marquette to be so valuable is something that's really an extension of that and how do we help support our students as well. When we look at mentoring and different mentor initiatives, I uh, wanted to share just a, an overview about the many different elements or components that you can factor in with your own programs or things that your programs that you're thinking about, whether it's flash mentoring, organic mentoring, peer-to-peer, -peer, local and or distance mentoring. Um, you see a variety of areas, but also where do those programs live and what do those programs look like in terms of the objectives that you want to accomplish. For Marquette, this is an example or this is our story in terms of the program that lives through the Marquette University Alumni Association and the partnerships and the collaborations that we've identified. So to turn back the clock a bit, to go back to even 2000, um, prior to 2013 when we launched the pilot, as I mentioned, um, we had a strong sense through our alumni national board that there was a significant interest in mentoring initiatives. We knew through, through our students that they wanted to be able to connect and engage with alumni and learn about career discernment and that career journey while they're on campus and, and well beyond that in terms of relationships that they can develop with their mentors. Also our alumni, uh, I mentioned 115,000 alumni globally. What we like to say is we can't always bring our alumni to Marquette in person. However, this is an initiative and an opportunity where we can bring Marquette to the alumni in the form of a student in terms of an, uh, as their mentee. Our campus partners, we had conversations with more than two dozen faculty, department chairs, university administration, and we asked them, if there was a, a mentoring initiative that we developed on campus, does your respective college, your respective major, uh, as the dean of students, is this something that you believe would be a partnership 
that students would find value in and that you as a, uh, as a faculty or representative of a department or of a college would see value in as well. It was a resounding yes. And so we knew that the trifecta as we call it, our student mentees, our mentor alumni, and then also our campus partners, we knew that there was a real opportunity to create a program that would make a significant difference. And because our program lives under the university advancement umbrella, we're a centralized institution. Um, the program lives in alumni engagement as part of the Marquette Alumni Association, as I mentioned. We also wanted to create an opportunity to engage, enhance, build, strengthen, develop uh, relationships with our alumni mentors. And I'll talk a bit about that as well. So when we talk about our stakeholders and what that means, I mentioned our mentees, our mentors, our campus partners, and then also advancement, where we found real strength behind this initiative has been that every stakeholder in this program has a key interest, they have a real benefit, but also they have a responsibility as well. So we drive the program through advancement, as I said, um, however, it's about ongoing communication and I'll share more about that as well. So a brief overview in terms of the program um, that we launched back in 2013-14 during the academic year um, as a pilot. As mentioned, it's collaboration with our alumni, our students, our faculty. It's run through the Alumni Association. But this is the key part in terms of where we really drive in or dive in with this program. And that is, is that this is a high touch program. So. Uh, this is what we found to be very successful because it lives in advancement. We want to make sure that there's a philanthropic opportunity to develop the relationship with our mentors. But the one-to-one -one match between the student and the alum is based on the student's college, their major, and then also their career interest. And we look at those matches as a not only a one-to-one -one element, but we also look at that as opportunities to look at where that student may consider residing after they graduate. Um, so as an example, if they're from the Milwaukee area, but they wanna to move to the West Coast and they're interested in becoming an attorney, let's say, we absolutely look at our mentors in terms of who might be on that West Coast to be able to provide them with some insight about what it's like to, um, to practice on the West Coast versus maybe in, in another area, as an example, like with entertainment, because obviously that's a major industry out on the West Coast. Our program is a local and distance initiative. Um, it is an opportunity where we celebrate our alumni. As I mentioned, we'd love to have them engage, and this is certainly an opportunity to uh, have them participate in our program as well. The program duration runs the entire academic year, so we kick off the program typically in October. Our Septembers are filled with uh, a process, our application process, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But through the entire program, as we prepare, for our eighth initiative with Marquette Mentors um, in the fall. The program cornerstone has always been that it's been mentee driven, accountability and metrics. With program um, being mentee driven, we make it very clear to the students. Our campus partners know this because it hasn't changed. The program has certainly evolved through the years and I'll share some more um, initiatives about that um, in a bit. But we make it very clear to the students that this is a mentee driven initiative and we make it very clear to the mentors as well. And by that, we mean the student has to drive the communication. They have to schedule the meetings with the mentors. They have to set the agenda. They have to lead on that communication. And we tell students when we interview them that if they have 10 priorities on campus, this has to be among the top three because it's very competitive. We wanna make sure that we have students who are in it um, wholeheartedly and they understand the responsibilities, but also, uh, for the mentors, they appreciate that this is not about three or four more things that they need to add on their to-do list in terms of scheduling meetings or following up. So we make it very clear. Unfortunately, because our campus partners are very engaged, they help provide us at times with encouragement or reaching out to those mentees who perhaps may not have made it um, as much of a priority. And that's a process that we'll talk about in a bit too. The second piece is that accountability. Um, that again, if they've got priorities on campus and they certainly do with academics, um, jobs, other extracurricular activities, they need to understand this. This is not what I call an oh by the way program. If we talk, that's great. If we don't talk, that's okay. We're all busy. 
that is not acceptable um, with our program. And our, our mentors have demonstrated how much they value that as well in our metrics, which is our, uh, our third program cornerstone. Our program is absolutely centered around metrics and being able to identify successes and also make adjustments as well along the way. Our alumni geographic representation, this most recent year, we had alumni in approximately 25 different states. And we also, for the first time, had our first alum who resided in Portugal. So when we talk about local, we certainly have many mentors who are here in Milwaukee. We have many mentors who are approximately 90 miles away from us, uh, just south of us in Chicago. But again, as you see here, we've got alumni in 25 plus states as well as Portugal. And the bottom line is that we found success around the program. While face-to-face -face mentoring can absolutely work and there's absolute benefits to that, we found real successes around our mentors who are uh, participating throughout the country. A few of the uh, companies you see here, um, alumni represent various organizations and industries um, across the globe. And these are just a few examples in terms of the companies that are represented by our alumni who run the program. So in terms of our program matches, I mentioned we launched the program in 2013-14 as a pilot. And it was a pilot. We were very clear in terms of keeping it small. And what that meant for us was identifying individuals who we wanted to participate in the program as mentors. And the way that we've recruited our mentors, we've been very fortunate. The way that we've recruited our mentors are individuals who have been involved or engaged within the university as volunteers. We have alumni who are part of our alumni national board through the Alumni Association who participate in the program. But we also work very closely with our development team, individuals who have developed relationships with our alumni who may have had conversations with those particular individuals about mentoring. Maybe they're mentoring in other organizations um, where they reside. But it was absolutely critical for us to be able to identify alumni who we had a very strong interest and likelihood um, that they would a participate but also be very engaged as well and i'll talk about our successes and where we've landed with our mentors um, and where we're at today i'll talk about that in just uh, a little bit so we launched our program with 30 matches and as you can see here um, we've now increased our mentor mentee matches up to almost 150 and we expect that we'll probably have around that same number for the 2020 2021 year as well but what's really key and i mentioned before about the high touch initiative that we've established at marquette through marquette mentors we look at this not as 145 matches we look at it as 290 relationships 145 student mentees 145 alumni mentors this is a high touch program this is about ongoing communication and support. And through the years, we've had nearly a 400% growth since 2013. And on top of that, we have a wait list of approximately 60 alumni who would like to participate in Marquette Mentor. So um, it's been absolutely essential in terms of working with our development team. And we have many individuals who participate in the program who refer other alumni to participate as well, just based on their experience. With respect to our campus partners, those organizations or there's the, those departments and majors who have been involved um, with the program. We kicked off in 2013 with communication, the College of Communication, College of Arts and Sciences, and also the College of Engineering. Within Arts and Sciences, we had um, several majors, English, psychology, philosophy among them. And if you look at those, um, I call those open-ended majors. The good news is you can do anything in your career with those. The bad news is you can do anything in your career with those. So we were very deliberate in terms of those campus partners that we identified initially. And today, as we look at 2019, 2020, we now have more than 20 campus partners who are involved, um, including all of the undergraduate colleges, the graduate school, we just added another campus partner yesterday. So we'll be inching toward 25 campus partners. And as you see on the screen, uh, we continue to add and they're all different. So it's not just colleges and majors, but also um, specific programs. 
that we identify and look to partner in terms of how to help get the word out and spread uh, the invitation opportunity for students to consider to apply. So the application, the interview process, and the timing we have found to be absolutely essential to ensure success for our mentors, for our mentees, for our campus partners. And the ongoing conversations that we've had with our mentors, uh, the relationships that we've been able to build. We have some mentors who have been in the program now. This will be their eighth student who they've mentored um, since 2013 when they were involved in the program. I mentioned those relationships. We have had many conversations. Um, the first year we just provided an application um, and in discussions with our mentors, they brought up the idea of would there be benefit to have an interview with the students. And also from a professional development standpoint, it's a way for those mentees, mentee applicants, to get a chance to participate in an interview. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a build around in terms of how do we not only focus on the relationship, but also look at how we can help our students with professional development. So the application is sent out. It's sent out through our campus partners. Uh, there's real uh, leverage that they have in terms of sending out an email to invite the students to apply. They identify each respective campus partner identifies which year of student they would like to invite based on their own curriculum. So they may have a professional development um, course in their curriculum that they see as a complement to Marquette Mentors. And again, it's an application process, so not everyone is accepted, uh, but we leave that to the campus partner in terms of who they would like to invite to participate or at least consider to participate in Marquette Mentors. But we're very clear in terms of the application and this process of understanding why they would like to participate or be considered um, as a mentee and Marquette mentors. But going back again to our goals and asking them specifically, what are three to four goals that they would like to accomplish with their mentor during the course of the program? Um, and it really puts them, um, it forces them to think about it. It forces them to think beyond just, well, I think a mentor would be a good idea. And I think that there's something that um, I can benefit from. Again, going back to our metrics and our accountability, we literally want pen to paper, and I'll talk about that, um, that demonstrates that the student has given thought to that. Now, the topics are open-ended. It's up to them, but we've certainly seen themes through the past seven years as we head into year eight of the program. It could be they want to expand their network. It could be that they want a job shadow. It could be that they want to better understand what a career might look like if they pursue that option. It could be they're interested in graduate school. It could be that they want to enhance their resume or practice interviewing. There's certainly themes, as I mentioned, throughout the years, but ultimately we leave that in the hands of the applicant. And they're very clear in terms of why they want us to consider them or why they would like to be considered as a mentee. Many of them talk about the fact that they're first generation or that they have no one in their family who is in the career or the industry or the profession that they're interested in um, learning more about and exploring. So we make that very clear in terms of the application, but then also for those interviews that we extend an invitation for those mentee applicants, uh, we work very closely with the campus partners. So when we look at those applicants last year, for the last three years, we've had more than 200 applicants in the program. We review every single applicant. It's um, done by looking at every single individual, their responses, but then we also work with our campus partner. So as an example, if we have an individual who's a communication major, we sit down and we work with our liaison in the College of Communication to think about, would this person be a good, um, a good mentee? They may know the student because they may have had them in class, they may have had them in their labs. Um, and so there's a real element there that our campus partners can provide that we don't through university advancement, because of course we don't work with the students as much as the colleges or the programs do. And so that's very valuable, but it's also important to note in terms of the application is that we never have and we never will uh, request grade point average because we wanna be able to give individuals an opportunity if their grade point average um, isn't perhaps where they would like it to be. Um, there may be reasons for that. And I think that what we found is that there are individuals who can really use a mentor and they're struggling. And this is a first step for them to reach out and to be able to engage. And at the same time, 
we've had many mentors who have said that they want to work directly with students who they feel that they can really make a dramatic impact in supporting, whereas some of our mentees who apply and who are accepted, they're already on a really solid track in terms of their own career development and discernment. So again, those discussions with our mentors um, and our campus partners are very critical. So the interviews, just to go through that very quickly, uh, it's very straightforward. It's a 15 minute interview. However, we require our mentee candidates to approach this as a professional interview. Uh, we tell them that it's business professional or business casual in terms of attire. And we look at that. Does the person show up on time? Does the person, uh, did the person read the email that they received in terms of attire? So we want to be able to understand why that student is interested in participating in the program. And because of the investment and the interest that many of our mentors have had, we've been fortunate to have mentors participate in the interview to ask the students questions and also campus partners as well. So um, it's been a great way to engage campus partners, our alumni as mentors, but also we've had mentees who have participated. We call them mentee alumni, and we invite them to participate in an interview. And they absolutely enjoy it because they're on the other side of the table asking the questions instead of being asked the questions. And the student being interviewed for the for the uh, for the program absolutely gloms on to that student to find out what that experience was. So there's a real peer-to-peer -peer element there as well. So with respect to timing, we review all of the applicants. We have an, a review sheet that we review, that we go through, um, identify the students that we want to select, who they would want to be matched with. We notify the students, and then there's a number of different um, processes that take place follow that, following that. In terms of timing, our academic year will be a little bit different this year, but generally speaking, toward the end of August, we reach out to our students or our applicants to invite them to participate in the program. That usually happens right before school starts. So toward the end of August, we give them about 10 days to complete the application. That is sent out again by the campus partners. Um, a, a reminder is sent out to the students to apply. All applications come through to, um, to us. So we vet those, we do those through an online application. Um, and then once we identify the interview candidates, then we do the interviewing. We did over 150 interviews over the course of about 10 days. Um, so it's very quick, but again, going back to our stakeholders and our mentors who've been in the program, it's absolutely essential that we found that interview process to be key. So by the time we go toward the end of September, we have our mentee mentor workshops that take place, and then our kickoff has typically been first part of October. I mentioned our metrics and our cornerstones, and these two documents here are the absolute essential in terms of how we measure success around the program. There are a couple of requirements. I mentioned our goals, but also our communication between our mentors and our mentees. Mentors and mentees, because this is a high touch program and we certainly understand that this is a initiative that's local and distance, uh, we require a minimum of one one hour conversation between the mentor and the mentee live conversation. Um, that's either over the phone, uh, in person, via Skype. Now, of course, Zoom is certainly a, a popular platform, uh, but the reason why it's so important to lay the groundwork is that, as I mentioned earlier, this is not an oh, by the way program. We're all busy. If we get a chance to connect, okay. If we don't, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. Uh, that's not acceptable with this program. So we require a minimum of one one hour conversation, as I said, at the outset of the program. So the first part of October, generally, the mentor and the mentee in their first discussion have that conversation. How many times are we going to have uh, this discussion? How are we going to do this? Um, is email and texting, is that okay as a complimentary form along with our live conversations? And what I can tell you is that while it's a minimum of one one-hour conversation between the mentor and the mentee, many, many, many conversations take place twice a month. Some even talk weekly and even daily. And so that's not completely unheard of, but it's just a demonstration of the relationship that's built the trust that's built and the value that both the mentors and the mentees see. And of course, we hear from many mentors about the reverse mentoring element and how much they've learned. And I'll share a great story about that in just a bit. 
So the students talk about that with their mentor. The other piece I talked about goals in terms of some of those examples. Again, first conversation, by the time that student is selected in the program and they have that first discussion with their mentor, the first conversation along with communication is specific goals that the mentor would like to be um, able to provide and support their mentee. So they're required to discuss the goals. They're required to outline deadlines, um, specific deadlines, and some of them are easier than others just based on perhaps internship application deadlines or grad school deadlines. But we encourage our mentors and our mentees to identify two goals for the first semester and then two goals for the last semester. So they're not putting down, they wanna complete all four goals by the end of April when the program concludes. Um, it's a progression and we wanna make sure that we do that um, in terms of the support. They agree to those goals, they sign the document, which is on the reverse side of the um, what you see here, and they submit those. And we file every single mentor-mentee match, and we keep track of those goals. And at the end of the year, as you see highlighted, um, on average, 90% of the mentors and the mentees indicate that they complete their goals by the end of the year. When I talk about our high-touch communication, the sustaining communication, this has been absolutely critical in terms of how we can track success, how we can provide support, and ultimately how we can ensure that the mentors and the mentees are, are getting the information that they need. And of course, we make ourselves available. In terms of staffing, I'm a full-time staff member. I work approximately 70% around Marquette mentors. And then I've been fortunate to have um, an intern um, or interns who work a total of about 25 hours during the course of the semester. But what's really important is we've been able to have mentees who participate in the program as the interns. So they know this program inside and out. So it makes it really easy in terms of a learning curve. So we have in-person um, gatherings. And of course, things have changed and we're absolutely adjusting in terms of what that will look like. And we'll talk about what happened in, in April and how we, how we shifted. Uh, but we'll be looking at some other program changes as well. We also provide training and workshops for all of our students, which is required. Anyone who's accepted in the program is required to participate um, in our advanced program kickoff training, as well as we have workshops for our mentors. And it's been great because for those mentors who have participated in the program for several years, they're able to instill their wisdom um, to fellow mentors who've participated. And so it's a real active discussion. Um, versus just saying that these are the three things that you need to do and, and go off. So that, again, there's a real investment that our mentors have put forth uh, as key partners in the program. We also provide mentor and mentee alumni directories. So in terms of an opportunity to expand networking, um, we tell our mentors, this is not about you having every single answer to the question that's asked by your mentee. We have a phenomenal group of alumni. Um, again, we provide that directory for all of our participants. So if they have a question, they can reach out to anyone, whether it's the student or it's the mentor. So it's a great way to build the network as well. But we also have mentee alumni directory. So we've had approximately 600 students who have been in the program um, as we head into this coming uh, program for year number eight. And we invite those mentees. So it's a way for us to connect with them. Please share your experience. What are you doing professionally? And can current mentees in the program or other mentee alumni reach out to you and ask questions? It could be a situation where a person is interviewing at a company where one of our mentee alumni um, are currently located. So it's a great way to extend that network beyond having the mentor feel like they have to have every single question answered. Um, our monthly communication, we have an average open rate of more than 70%. We hear from our mentors and our mentees. They love to see stories about examples um, of mentors and mentees working together and best practices and what we found. We also track this. We have an online survey at the midpoint of the program. So we usually send that out in January after the start of the second semester. And then we also do an end of year survey as well. And that, that information is absolutely key. But at the end of the day, personal communication is um, at the heart of what makes this program high touch. Um, we want to establish those relationships. Uh, I like to say no surprises. If we find out at the end of the program that uh, a mentor or mentee isn't having or didn't have a very good experience, how can we make that shift? How can we make that adjustment? So we have checkpoints. We have our interns reach out to our mentees to see where things are at and how to make sure we can support the students too. Whoops. 
job shadowing our travel stipend is just another example of uh, an initiative that's been very successful. Uh, we've been fortunate that our mentors support Marquette mentors philanthropically. Um, and our students just for the second year last year were invited to request and complete a travel stipend application where we would cover the airfare or the mileage or the train fare for those individuals who have a mentor who reside outside of uh, the Milwaukee area to go and submit. So just as an example, we've got Chicago, Northern California, Southern California, New York, Atlanta, um, Dallas, Washington, DC. Those are just a few of the cities where our students were able to go and travel and job shadow our, um, our mentors. And of course, in light of the pandemic, um, everything unfortunately um, came to a screeching halt. And that included some of those students who had planned to visit their mentors um, and job shadow them. So fast forward at the end of the program in terms of what we've provided um, and how we've responded, responded as market mentors in terms of the pandemic then and now. Back in April, we had always scheduled our end of the year program at the end of April. And um, as things happened, um, as they did, uh, it was decided on our end that we weren't going to have our in-person finale and our in-person celebration. Um, however, several mentors and mentees had reached out and said they certainly understand why, but would there be a way that we may be able to connect virtually and celebrate? And um, we worked directly with some of our mentor leaders who are part of our leadership council, and they said, let's do this. Let's try to make something that um, can be a valuable experience. And um, it was remarkable. We offered break room sessions in advance of the formal finale that we had, and um, they were all based on topics, those break room sessions. So I was able to identify some of our mentors who would lead the panel discussions within key industries. And so that was communication or healthcare, engineering, entrepreneurship, legal, graduate school. So we had about 10 different break rooms. And frankly, I thought we were going to have maybe 25 to 50 people who would register for the break room um, prior to the formal kickoff. Out of the 125 individuals who we had register, we had 123 who indicated that they wanted to participate in the break room. So that idea of networking, that idea of being able to connect with each other, and it wasn't just our mentors and our mentees who we invite for the finale, we also invited our mentee alumni. And the fact that that many individuals showed up, and you can see here the, the screen of individuals who participated. And so that's a Zoom screen. Take that image there and multiply that times five because we had 125 individuals participate. But then also, interesting story, when we interviewed one of our applicants earlier in the year, he mentioned that he was in a band. And I just noted that. And um, I did remember that. And I reached out to the individual, his name is Tyler, and I said, you know, would you and your band be interested in maybe recording a couple of songs that we could share as part of the, the finale? And he gave an absolute 100% yes. And as you can see here in the image, they're social distance and they played a couple of songs. So it was a, a fun way to do it. And so we definitely shifted, um, but we had individuals in 25 different states who were on the call and got just great, great feedback. But what we learned is that there is a way for us to be able to engage virtually and that people really want to participate. And so what's ahead and what's new as we look ahead to our program for this year, we're going to build around that. We're going to have panel workshops specific to conversations or industry topics, smaller groups led by mentors so they can have smaller discussions. We don't want to have a, a, a Zoom call with 40 or 50 individuals just because it's a little overwhelming. Let's make those small enough where people can feel comfortable having the conversation. We're also launching a LinkedIn group for Marquette Mentors. We have about a thousand individuals who have been in the program since we started. So it's a great platform to continue to engage individuals. But how do we maximize our collaboration and how do we identify ways that we can think of that are new, knowing that right now our, our travel stipend or our job shadow program is not something that's going to be possible um, for the foreseeable future. But then also, how do we continue to provide opportunities for our mentors and our mentees and our campus partners to engage? A couple of things just in terms of sustaining success. I mentioned earlier, we've had many mentors who've participated in the program every year. The left side of the frame there is one of our mentors having dinner with her mentee's family. Uh, they both reside in the Phoenix area and that extension of 
connecting with family and the student and the mentor relationship has just been significant and phenomenal. The middle frame there is not a, a duplicate photo. It's actually uh, our alumna's four different students who she's mentored through the years, um, demonstrating individuals who have really made an impact with a variety of different students and meaning relationship, meaningful relationships as well. And then also our mentee alums return, they come back, they're engaged, they're very involved. They're our best advocates in terms of uh, wanting to get involved. And in terms of our mentors, we typically require a minimum of five years from graduation because of course, um, as young alums, you're starting to just get acclimated to life in the professional world and what that may look like. And so we try to keep them engaged through various ways as well. Celebrating our success, we now have mentees who are participating in the program as mentors. We also had a, just a great story here on the right frame there. Um, Steve Russian is an author and writer for Sports Illustrated. Um, he had conversations, continued conversations with his mentee, Denny, who's right in the middle there. And Denny had suggested, you know, have you ever thought about doing a podcast um, with your wife, who's Rebecca Lobo, women's basketball great, played at UConn, um, and just great family. And Steve indicated to Denny that he didn't know anything about a podcast or how it would work. And so thanks to Denny's insight and suggestion, Steve and Rebecca have a podcast called Ball and Chain. It's a weekly podcast. And the executive producer is none other than Denny right there. So that idea of reverse mentoring that I mentioned is absolutely key. We also identify our mentors um, who are in the program to continue that relationship, but also our mentees. How can they provide support for high school students who may be considering Marquette? And we came up with an Encuentros mentoring program, which is a partnership with Jesuit, uh, Crystal Ray Jesuit High School in Milwaukee. And we found success for that because it's built a pipeline for high school students to consider Marquette as well. So our engagement beyond Marquette um, is leadership. As I mentioned, we have alumni who are involved in our alumni national board who are mentors, young alumni council. You see a number of other leadership roles that our mentors have. So it's certainly a door opener for them to get involved with Marquette on a broader basis. Uh, we also have mentors who have been recognized as alumni award recipients who were never even on our radar, who've been very engaged uh, through the years, even so much to the point where they're being recognized for their own professional development and achievements uh, through our Marquette Alumni Magazine. Living in university advancement as Marquette Mentors does, of course, philanthropy is absolutely important. When we launched the program, we had about 30% of our individuals, again, it was 30 mentors who participated, who had given not not to market mentors, but to any university designation. Fast forward to last year, we had our high for the program, 75% or about 130 mentors participated of the 130 mentors, 75% of them made a gift. And one of the things um, that really made it so successful was based around a cookie promotion that one of our mentors suggested. Is there a way that we can provide a show of support for our mentees by giving them uh, a cookie package. We did um, these personalized cookies with the Marquette logo, Marquette Mentors logo on there. Um, and it was a great way for the mentors to support the mentees. And then we also included a small gift portion that went toward the initiative as well. This year, in light of the pandemic, we were still able to achieve more than 60% of giving through our mentors. So um, we did that through a number of different ways, beyond just straight solicitation, we did our Marquette Mentors pen opportunity and that received some significant interest as well. Leadership, we've developed different programs, um, the Marquette Leadership Council, our Mentee Alumni Leadership Committee. So how do we keep mentees engaged? Um, and what we found through our philanthropy and through our advancement is that mentors and mentee alumni are making gifts for the first time. They're making recurring gifts and they're making their largest gifts. And it isn't just about supporting Marquette mentors because of course they're doing that through volunteering. Uh, this is about donor designation. So while many mentors feel very closely and um, connected to the initiative, they also feel very strongly about other university opportunities as well in terms of giving. So whether it's scholarship or their own respective college, um, we leave that to the mentor in terms of the, the donor designation as well. 
our metrics, again, it goes back to the metrics. Um, these are some of the statistics that we've seen through the years. 90% um, of the individuals participate in the program every year. So that means they return. Um, and this year we're tracking more than 97%, despite the fact that we're in light of the pandemic and there are so many things that are happening, but I think our mentors see the value that they can still provide students as well. A couple of testimonials there in terms of the involvement and what people have seen. Um, and this was a testimonial that uh, a Marquette parent whose daughter was in the program shared about how they found value in the program. So when parents get the endorsement or the parents are seeing value in participating um, through, their, through their son or daughter, um, that means a lot as well. So our pitfalls, just to close this out here, you know, these are some of the things that we found. Again, I mentioned I'm really busy. Um, everyone is busy. The reality of that um, is also a translation that says this is not a priority. Um, communication is essential, um, but then also scaling too quickly is something to be very mindful of. Uh, again, we're a high touch program, so we want to make sure that we have an opportunity to be able to build relationships versus just saying that we're going to grow the program just for the sake of growing. We're very deliberate. In fact, our mentors have been very supportive of that to say, you know what, we've got a great initiative here. Let's do it for the right reasons versus just saying that we're growing just to grow. Five keys of what we've learned, establishing goals, setting clear objectives are among them. What are the expectations of the individuals? the mentors, the mentees, the campus partners, university advancement, but also to measure it, to track regularly, make adjustments. We thought big, we started small, and we when we moved quickly. Um, so here we are as we present uh, or prepare for year number eight of the program. But also number five here, seek ongoing insights and wisdom from your stakeholders. Find out what's working, find out what isn't, find out how they can be involved and engaged. Um, so. With that, I just want to say thank you. Um, please feel free to reach out to me um, with any questions. And most of all, good luck with your initiative. And hopefully, we'll be able to connect soon. Thanks very much. Dan, thank you so much. Um, we've had quite a few questions come in. And um, we'll have about 15 minutes here to, to get through as many as we can. Um, and feel free for everyone, uh, everyone listening to um, continue to enter questions in with that Ask a Question button. Um, Dan, um, we, we've got quite a few here. Um, um, someone is just asking, and I, I think you alluded to this a little bit, but just can you elaborate a little more on um, if you have a dedicated staff person for this, what's the kind of total number of, of hours maybe that, that go into this each year um, or kind of full-time employees? There, there's several kind of questions about that that people want. Sure. Thanks, Zach. So, you know, I've been involved in the program ever since we launched it, so prior to 2012. So there certainly is um, the benefit of having the relationships with so many mentors through the years. And right now, as we're in the midst of the renewal process, for me, um, it's as simple as an email or a text. And obviously, having live communication is always an option. But um, the relationship that's been built around the mentors certainly makes a significant difference. Um, but in terms of the timing, there are certainly peaks and valleys right now. Um, I mentioned about 70% of my time is spent toward in support of Marquette mentors. That certainly can shift throughout um, over the course of the year. But I would say um, it does. It can be 100% as we prepare for the program, like the interviews, those are nonstop over the course of a couple weeks. We're working toward our program and things along those lines. I think it's important to be realistic, but I think it goes back to what I mentioned earlier, and that is identify what your goals are. So if there's a request or there's a discussion with individuals who you are working with as far as the opportunity for a mentor initiative, identify what those goals are. I can't speak. We've never had an online platform with Marquette Mentors. As I said, it's high touch. Um, I can just speak from our own experience. So online is a little bit different. But during the course of the academic year, um, it really starts to peak as we get closer toward um, the end of August and September because we're viewing those applications. So that's from August until about the uh, uh, first part of October when we launch. That's probably about 90% of my time. Um, that I spend on that once the program launches. Um, there's always things to work on, such as newsletters and so forth. Um, so there are peaks and valleys, but I would say in terms of high points, 
that I found, the kickoff, um, and then toward the end of the year, the program, but there's always ongoing communication. And as I said, um, that high touch element with being able to reach out and send someone a text or an email um, is, is absolutely essential. Our newsletter takes a lot of time, however, our new LinkedIn group will take a lot of time, but um, the more that you can forecast what the year will look like and to be able to communicate that to uh, your other stakeholders on campus, I think it helps them understand what your goals are throughout the year. Great, thank you, Dan. Um, we, we have someone asking for a little more clarity on how you vet each mentor um, uh, beyond, and it seems like there's a, obviously a lot of, they've already been mentors before, and so you, you expect they would do a, a great job again. Um, but for when you're trying to bring in new mentors, how how are you finding those people and making sure they're, they're gonna do an excellent job with the program? Sure, absolutely. So it, they may have mentored before, I mentioned that earlier. They may have mentored in another organization, which is great if that's the case. However, the way that we vet our mentors is that, first of all, more times than not, they come recommended by one of our development or engagement colleagues, or perhaps somebody who is um, on the faculty end. So there's that in terms of credibility. Um, I interview every single mentor um, to outline the expectations, learn about their career, learn about um, what is involved in the program. Again, going back to the fact that it's mentee driven. So we make it very clear so that that one-to-one -one interview, um, it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort However, the retention is obviously paid off significantly. So we make sure that it's it's a very clear discussion. We don't we send them general overview of the program, but the live conversations are absolutely imperative. Um, and that's frankly one of the reasons why we have uh, a wait list of more than 70 people is because of word of mouth where mentors will recommend other individuals to participate in the program as well. But uh, again, it's very deliberate we make sure that everyone hears loud and clear what the expectations are in terms of participation in the program. Um, and that's that's how we've developed that. There's not an online forum different than our mentee application. So we make it very clear. And we also have what we call boomerang mentors. So there will be mentors who take a year off for professional reasons or whatever it may be, but they want to come back and they come back. So it's just a demonstration of how invested they are in the program and how much they want to support students. Great. Um, we, we have a few questions connected to kind of diversity goals for the program. Um, is there anything you actively do to try to bring in um, students of color, um, people who maybe would, would otherwise not be as, as likely or um, as, as easily maybe have access to the program or be as likely to be recommended by, because um, uh, it sounds like a lot of the student mentors are also coming from there, um, from their respective colleges. Um, so any any efforts in, in on that side of things as well? Absolutely. Yeah, so a couple of things. One is, as you mentioned, Zach, we, um, the respective partners, whether it's the college or the major or the program, um, while they send out email communication, um, that's where campus partners, that's where they come in. If they know a student who they think would really benefit from the program, that one-to-one -one inv invitation is absolutely key. But we also keep a particular eye on what the individual indicates in their application. So as an example, if they say, as I said earlier, if they're first generation, if they have absolutely no sense of what they may wanna do and what that may look like, we also work closely with one of our campus partners, um, our urban scholars who work directly with students of color who are scholarship recipients. We also will be working with um, our uh, educational opportunity program, which is a national uh, model across the country. So we have ongoing communications uh, with campus partners, our students, and that's where, again, I mentioned before, our students who've participated in the program, I just had a discussion with several students last week who have said, I want to reach out to my friends because it's important for them to understand the value of this program. So when you get that word of mouth or you get that endorsement from someone who's a friend or who's part of another organization that you're involved in, that can go a, that can go a really long way. So um, we're not only mindful of individuals of color with respect to students, but also with respect to our alumni mentors as well. Great, great. Um, 
Dan, we, we have another question here specifically about scaling. I'm just asking if you can elaborate a little bit more on how someone might scale too quickly and what you found an ad adequate amount of, of scaling each year would, would be. That's a great, that's a great question. Um, I'm just laughing because, of course, when you scale, you're projecting what you may want to do. And there have been certainly were times um, during the program where I think we jumped a little bit ahead of ourselves, but we, we paused. I think in terms of scaling, you have to ask yourself the question, where will the program live? What are the objectives in terms of what are you trying to accomplish? Are you after, um, you know, are you seeking quantity? Are you interested in saying, we have 200 mentor-mentee matches, um, and that is just a demonstration of how our mentors or our alumni really want to engage and support students, which is fantastic. However, if you want to be able to measure that, if you want to be able to track what's, how do you identify or how do you determine what's been a success? We found it's been absolutely essential to identify what our goals are before we launch the program. And I mentioned our metrics in terms of putting pen to paper and saying, these are the goals that you want to adjust or you want to identify to. Um, identify what is, what's the objective and then identify how you're potentially going to scale it. So just as an example, when we launched the program, we had 30 matches, it was phenomenal. Everyone indicated that it was a great success. There was value, campus partners, our students, our alumni. So we jumped it from 30 mentors, uh, mentee matches, from 30 mentor mentee matches up to 60, which is significant. And you can say, well, that's only 30 more matches. However, um, again, I said, I don't look at that as matches. I look at that as relationships. And so to all of a sudden to be working with 60 individuals and then you're going to 120 individuals, that's significant. And you always have those programs that you have in place. However, when you have more individuals, you have more work. And, and that means more work in terms of building the relationship. So my suggestion in terms of scaling it is, as I said, identify who's the owner of the program, who's going to drive that. So if someone comes to you and says, we've got to, let's double this program. It's really important to be able to help them understand, okay, that's great if we're going to double it. However, to also understand if these were the goals, A, B, and C, this is how this is how they may be impacted if we if we try to extend too much. But I think it's also imperative to have your stakeholders be a voice in that process, not at the end when they're saying, okay, let's scale it and double it. But how do you have that conversation throughout the course of the program so they understand what are the high points, what are some challenges, so you can make those adjustments as well. Great. Um, Dan, you mentioned the newsletter a few times, and someone's just asking for a little more about that. What do you include in the monthly newsletter? Um, what's what's kind of the purpose of that in, in bringing sure. the community together? Yeah, great question. So when we've provided a monthly newsletter, we also have our toolbox. I'm sorry I didn't include it in here. Um, I'll give our URL for our mentor toolbox. It's uh, go.mu, as in Marquette University, go.mu dot edu slash mentors, plural, M-E-N-T-O-R-S. Um, but our newsletter is a way to highlight those successes. Um, we often feature in many of our newsletters from the past year on that, uh, on that mentor toolbox, so feel free to take a look there. Uh, we highlight success stories between mentors and mentees. We highlight job shadowing. We've, again, going back to our surveys, we always ask our mentors and our mentees, what do you find to be of most value with the newsletter? And there's a couple of things. One is sharing experiences. One is providing tips about um, strong relationships. Um, another one is we've done um, five questions with where we'll highlight a mentor or a mentee in terms of their first job or what was their experience in um, making an adjustment with their career. But it's all about the mentors and the mentee. So in many cases, they see themselves. We also do something called in the news where if a mentor has a promotion or a student was just named as president of their organization, but it's not just recognizing that individual, we also indicate who that person's mentor or their mentee is. And so um, they're, very, they're all human interest stories um, where we can include any sort of case studies um, about mentoring and what that means. Um, we always include that. And so when we can, we also look to have students write about their own experiences as well. So there's a real engagement element um, that just goes beyond a, a traditional newsletter. Um, and then we also include slideshows where we're able to, at the end of the year, that highlights all the activities. And that's one thing, um, Zach, just to mention too, 
you see the photos that are here, um, almost all of them are from within the last year or so. If there's one thing that any of the program participants would tell you that I tell them way too often, it's please get a photo because those photos tell the story and we're able to document the successes that, um, that they've been able to share with us through the years. Great, great. Um, we may have time for one more question here and we, we've got quite a few. Um, Well, well, maybe a quick one. Um, someone just asked, um, do you um, do you require Title IX training for all of your your mentors, or do they have to certify that they have that training somehow? So that might be a quick one. Sure, um, we do not. However, we work closely with the Office of General Counsel. We have terms and conditions that we share, and code of conduct documents that we share with our um, our mentors that all of them receive, and then we also have our alumni um, volunteer confidentiality agreement. So any documents such as the mentor directory that I mentioned earlier that we've shared um, through um, through our personal communication, so we don't post the directories or anything like that. Um, all of our mentors and all of our mentees are required to sign a confidentiality agreement just so this is not about them um, for personal gain. It's about volunteering and it's about them providing support through a program that's part of Marquette. Great, great. And then maybe maybe one last question then, just um, asking about the onboarding and orientation process, um, I guess both for for a, a new, say a, a brand new mentor and a brand new mentee, someone who's never, never been through the program before. Sure, so for mentors, I mentioned we have, um, we call them workshops, we don't, workshops, we don't call them training sessions, we don't call them orientations, we call them workshops because we invite all of our mentors and our mentees to participate. So a couple of things. One is because I've had the personal conversation with the mentor to be. Um, they have a sense of what the program is, but then also um, during those training sessions for the mentors, we talk about things to expect. And again, that goes back to really leveraging the relationships that we have with our mentors to be able to, I'll reach out to individuals who are saying, are you participating in the workshop or can you? Um, I'd love to highlight um, I'd love for you to talk about your story and how you started that relationship with your mentee. So again, it's a peer-to-peer -peer element. We've also had guest speakers talk about um, their own experiences in terms of what that meant. We've had individuals who are executive recruiters talking about things to help provide support for their students. So there's a learning element as well. And then for our mentees, um, we have training we do have orientation workshops um, for all of our students. They're all required to attend. So we have a series of different workshops over the course of the week. But I mentioned our mentee alumni network. So these are individuals who I said participate in our interviews as an additional person. Um, however, we have a panel of students and we'll have probably about 20 students this year who've raised their hand, who we've identified, um, a collaboration, who've really done a great job. So they give that opportunity to talk about how they established the relationship with their mentor. What was their first discussion like? And I laugh because um, I always ask the question during those orientations, who's nervous to reach out to your mentor? And they have to call them. It's not about texting and it's not about emailing them. Who's nervous to have that first conversation to call your, your mentor and about half of them raise their hands. And I joke with the other half saying, you're just, you know, you're just too cool to raise your hand and embarrassed to say that. Um, you're nervous. And that's just, you know, that's developing the professional relationship. But the point is that mentee alumni leadership um, group, these are students who participated within the last couple of years. So I give them the opportunity to talk about their own experience, which is a heck of a lot more interesting and engaging than someone as the leader of the program, as a director, to talk about you need to do this and you need to do this and you need to do this. There's certainly an element of that. Um, but the more we can get individuals who are already part of the program engaged, that's where we found the real success. And it's an ongoing process. We do our mid-year check-in in the fall, and then we also do a workshop at the end of, uh, or in the middle of spring too. Great, Dan, thank you so much for your time today. Um, certainly a, a model program for the kind of high touch student alumni mentoring. Um, I went ahead and put your email back up on the screen. Um, I know we couldn't get to everyone's questions today, um, but I know you've been kind enough to, to help people um, who, who have questions or, or want to connect in the past. So um, that's, that's certainly available. Um, and I can also add that uh, mentorship toolbox resource um, 
to the um, uh, to the webinar site. So that'll be linked below, um, and the recording of this will also be available later um, for, um, for for everyone who registered. Um, so Dan, thank you so much um, for everyone who attended. Thank you so much. Um, and our next um, our webinar in this series will be about. Um, um, uh, kind of finding the cause for and purpose behind development and philanthropy um, from two uh, two very engaging speakers um, who, um, uh, so I, I highly recommend that. That's on our alumlc.org slash webinar site. Um, thanks again, Dan. Thanks for everyone for attending and hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Dan, thank you so much.